Welcome back. So let's continue from last time. We um, we got to see this shifting technique and apply applied this method to prove Kruska Katona, um, where the, this shifting basically the philosophy is we have an extremal problem for a generic family of sets. Um, so the generic family of sets could look very, very wild. And while shifting uh, operation, we, sh we, we can change, transform our family to some specific types um, with, with lots of structures, which help us to, to simplify the problem. We, we only need to restrict our attention to spe specific family of, uh, of sets. So, Today we will see another example of shifting technique on um, another yet very important lemma, the sour shala lemma, and um, the uh, about a very important notion VC dimension. So let's recall this definition that we started last time. So recall we have a let's recall everything. We have some family of sets. Um, a family of subsets of some ground set X where X could be infinite and um, for a set, let's say S a subset of the ground set we define the uh, trace of this family or this hypergraph on S to be all the intersection of the sets in our family with this set of points S. I'm called trace because this is the trace of F on S, right? So the name um, is quite fitting here. So, um, and we say a set S is shattered If the trace by shattered by F, if the trace of F on S um, contains all possible subset of S, including the empty subset. In other words, for any subset of S could be empty set, we can find the set in our family such that how f intersect s is exactly this f, s prime, right? If, if you want to see a picture, this is s, no matter which um, s prime that you take could be empty sets, I can find the um, set, this set um, f, in our family, the intersecting S exactly S, S prime, nothing more. And the largest cardinality of a set shattered by S is defined to be the VC dimension of this family. And um, the VC dimension of F is defined to be the largest set, size of largest set shattered by F. Let's see some examples. Let's see some examples. Um, all right. Example one. Example one, let's look at um, uh, some infinite setting of ground sets where the ground set is uh, R1. Let's consider X is real line. 
and let's consider our f are all closed intervals. in R, okay? So we can ask, what is the VC dimension of F? Meaning we need to find the largest sets of points on the real line shattered by F. Um, first of all, uh, the claim is the VC dimension of F equals to two. Then we need to prove two things, one, lower bound, at least two. At least two means what we, we need to find two points that are shattered by uh, intervals. This is easy. You just take any two points. Take any two points, um, let's say points, um, today is May 14, so let's take points four of, Five and fourteen, okay, and we claim that you take any two points, May fourteen, those are shattered by uh, intervals. Um, here, those shattered. Then we need to do what for every subset of S, which is this pair. We need to find the set which is a close interval intersecting this set S with exactly that subset, right? So we need. 2 to the 2, 4 intervals, shattering with all different shape of traces on this pair of points. Meaning, we need a purple one containing both of them. You can just take 1 to 20. You need a... It's too thick, no? You need a purple one containing all of them. You need one that contains only 14, let's say 13 to 20. You need one that containing only five, you can take one to five, and you need something containing nothing, shattering the empty set. That's also easy. You just take, um, oops, it's tilted. You just take uh, 20 to, to, I don't know, 30, right? It's easy to prove. We also have to prove upper bounds that there is no three points. What does upper bound mean? There's no triple points shattered by our collection of closed intervals. This might look easy, but bear with me. Let's walk through easy examples to slightly harder examples. So less than three, what do we have to prove? Um, we have to prove this is exist a pair is this the shattered two sets? This means we need to prove for any three sets, it is not shattered. Okay, this is also easy. We take any three points. Okay, this is. This year is 2024, 20, May 14. Let's take these three points on the real line. How do we show that this is not shattered? That means we need to find a subset sum S priming S such that no f in f satisfies f intercept s is s prime, correct? Nothing in f shatters s prime. Anyone, can anyone tell me which subset of this triple is not shattered? Type in the chat. If you can see it quickly, give you five seconds. Okay, five seconds up. Um, this I can take actually the first point and the last point. Uh, this this is my choice of s prime. I take s prime to be 
five and two zero two four. Now, if you think about it, no interval containing both of them can exclude the midpoint fourteen. Okay, so this is the formal proof that the family of all closed intervals in the real line R one has this dimension two. This is easy. No, let's move on to harder examples. Let's look at, um, good. So during this course so far, we've been training ourselves to ask questions, right? So we see here the closed intervals are convex sets in R1. So you take all the convex sets, sort of, let's forget about open intervals. Let's only consider closed sets at the moment. You take all the Closed convex sets in R1, it has bounded VC dimension 2. Then the natural thing to ask is what happened to R2, R3, R4? Is it also true that if you take closed convex planar convex sets in R2, say, it has bounded VC dimension? That would be the next step. But turns out this is not true. It's only true in one dimension. So already, in R2, in the plan, if you take all the closed convex sets, this dimension could be infinite. Uh, I forgot to record you. If there, if there exist arbitrarily large sets that's shattered by F, we say the VC dimension is infinite. So here's an example of families with infinite VC dimension. So, but, Closed convex sets in higher dimension already in R2. Have infinite VC dimension. So let's see this example two. Let X to be R2 and F are all convex sets. You can let it be closed convex set, doesn't matter. So our claim is that the VC dimension of F is infinite. What does it mean? That means we can for arbitrary integer n, we have to find a set of m points. So let me write down what we have to prove. Meaning, i.e., for any n, we need to find m point sets shattered by f. If you, I'm pretty sure if I, if I give you one or two minutes to think about it, you, you'll come up with this example, but let me just tell you what it is now. You just take M points that lie on the, the say, unit circle, say, lie on the circle, okay? Let's take M points. Da, 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 da. Okay, since I draw all of them, I need I don't need dot dot dot. All right, then for any subset of that, let's say this one, this one, this one, this one. I just take some arbitrary one. Let's say this uh, quadruple. Then there is a convex set intersecting these endpoints on the circle exactly at these four po red points. You just simply draw. I can I can take this. So I choose these four points, right? I can just take um, this guy. 
This is convex sets, right? No, I don't. I don't like this. Very easy. So that means what? That means if you consider all convex sets in the plane, that's too complex combinatorially. You can is there exist the arbitrarily large shattered sets, which means, um. That's not the end of the story. We can still ask questions. If this whole collection is too complex, can we then consider some meaningful, nice subcollection, which then have bounded VC dimension? And the answer is yes. There are many things we can consider. One natural thing you can consider is the largest such convex sets. So what will be the largest one in the plane as a convex set? The half plane, right? You cut the plan, make a cut, you just take everything to the right or everything to the left. These are the largest possible convex sets, infinite size. And let's look at the VC dimension of such thing. So collection of collections of all convex sets too complex. What about some special subcollection, subfamily? Here's the next example. Um, if you look at the half spaces, half planes in R2. So this is my X. The collection of all half planes is my F. Um, my claim is the VC dimension is three. And this is true for all higher dimension as well. If you take all the half spaces in R3, VC dimension is four. If you take all the um, half spaces in RD, VC dimension is D plus one. Okay? But let's only look at the planar case. How do we prove it? Well, same as before, we need to prove lower bound and upper bound. Lower bound means we need to find VC dimension three, right? We need to find triple of points that are shattered by half planes. So this is easy. You just take three points in some generic position, this general position, and what are the... So I'll just draw some of them. For all the single points, I can take this half space. Shattering the top point, I can take um, this, similarly, shattering this, this, shattering the bottom right point, right? For pairs of points, you can just take the complement of this, then shatter the pair. Complement of the red one, shattering the, this pair. Complement of the green one, shattering this pair. All right? So now we shatter six subsets of this triple. You're eight in total. We are missing the empty sets and everything. Empty sets, easy. You just take everything far away. Everything, you just take the complement of that. All right. So the last one we need, which color I haven't used. Let's just use yellow. Just take, take this or this other way. Or empty set or everything. Is that clear? Less than four, what does it mean, less than four? Less than four means for every quadruple, we need to prove for every quadruple, some subset is not shattered. For every four point, some subsets, not a trace. Now, there are two cases to consider. 
if you have four points, you have two cases. One, these four points form a convex position. Is in convex position, not convex position. Not convex position means what? Some point is in the convex hole of the other point. It could look like this, or it could look like even just the degenerate case. Some two points lie in the convex hole of the other two points. So this include this case, all right? This is more degenerate. Four on the lines, even more degenerate. So these two cases uh, encompass all possible scenario. Convex position, not convex position. Now we need to argue in both cases, we can find some subsets that's not a trace. In the first case, consider this. This is my, we need to find some S prime, right? This is my S prime, the red one. Why? Or well, proved by picture. If you have a half space containing these two points, then it must also contain either this point or this point, all right? I will not prove it rigorously, but try to prove it rigorously yourself. For case two, I'm gonna use, the choice is also obvious, the outer three points. Yeah, for any closed half spaces containing these three points, necessarily this point must be also included. So this triple cannot be a trace. Good. So one more example, it's basic dimension of half spaces, half planks. Um, let me leave you an uh, exercise So this exercise is, we, we consider some special collections. So this is what we're trying to do here in this example, some special sub-collection, uh, verify that it has found the visit dimension. Another very natural special sub-collections in the plane are axis parallel boxes. Okay, so what is the visit dimension of the family of all axis parallel boxes? Okay, these are the axis parallel boxes. Means the sides of these boxes, the rectangle, is parallel to x and y axis in the plane. So if you let x again be R2, f is all axis aligned rectangles. Proof that the VC dimension of F equals to four. So, um, Next, let's see a finite ground set example. Here, all the ground set are real line, plane, or some RD, it's infinite size. Let's look at the finite ground sets, another example. Let's consider ground set X to be the first n integers, and our F, uh, this notation, do you remember? All n over two subsets of the first n integers, all the half sets. This VC dimension it's not hard to see, it's n over two. Okay, why? First of all, for any set of size n over two plus one, 
nothing shatters everything because all our sets has size n over two. So it's at most n over two. To prove the lower bound, well, if you look at for any set of size n over two, for any set of size n over two here, and you take any subsets of size, some size k, I can then take n over two minus k elements in the complement to form a set of size n over two, which intersect this blue n over two size sets exactly at this green k sets. Now, this is also easy. VC dimension is growing with respect to the ground sets. It's a large basic dimension example. So we will consider this family to be relatively complex. Okay, good. So seeing all these examples, I hope that you get some good feelings about what VC dimension is about. Now let's get to the key lemma. The uh, sour shallow lemma. Sour shallow lemma, it's uh, trying to give an upper bound on the size of a family when it has bounded basic dimension. Okay. Where's the formulation? Okay, let me put this simpler formulation. The simpler formulation is the following. For any family F of, which is a collection of subset of first n integers, if the VC dimension is D, Then we can, the F cannot be too large. How large is F? Is M most. N choose zero. N choose one. Da, da, da. It's the first D plus one layer, so binomial coefficients. All right. Several remarks I want to make here before we get to the proof. The first remark is that This bound is the optimal, which you always ask ourselves. Well, the answer here is yes, the bound is optimal. How do we see it? You can just first, you just take the, the bottom B layers. Then how many empty sets? One. How many singletons? And just one of them, and just two and to steal of the D set, you take this union. Obviously, this dimension is D because we don't even have a set of size D plus one and most D, right? Equals to D. Second remark is that um, sour shell lemma is actually slightly stronger As seen, we can actually use it to bound the size of traces. In fact, um, we get sour shallow in fact is slightly stronger if bounds size of traces of F on any sets um, 
of size uh, or any sets. So what does it mean? It means um, for any f, which is on some ground set two to the x, okay, and um, we know with VC dimension D, then for any subset S of the ground set of size, let's say M, you take some subsets, then we know if you look at the trace of F on this set S, it's at most M plus zero, da da da, M plus D. All right. So not only if we have a family on some ground sets with bounded basic dimension, not only we can bound the size of this family, we can actually bound, you can zoom into any subset S and look at the trace and bound the size where this we use make use of the size of that set here. Um, but these two are almost the same, even though this looks slightly stronger. The reason is that the VC dimension of the trace is no larger than the VC dimension of the original family. So by applying this shower shell on the trace, on this ground set S, we basically get the same conclusion. So it's not actually stronger. So this is because we get this version from SS for free as um, the VC dimension of the trace is no more than that of F. Okay. So now let's focus on this slightly easier version and try to prove it. The proof, as I said, um, I will give you three proofs. One of which I will only give you a, an idea and then leave it as exercise. Let's first see um, um, induction proof. Let's try to use induction proof mixed with uh, this shifting, similar as we've seen in Kruska Katona. So what would be a natural thing to do when we have a family in two to the end and we try to use induction? One natural thing to do induction is try to get rid of element N, the last element. Then we are in a slightly smaller ground set, so we can use induction, okay? So let, let us see two proofs using induction. Okay. There is actually, yeah. So the first proof, so what will be two natural way of induction? Um, the first natural way of induction, so to do induction, natural way is to get rid of an element, say n, element n, then we are on the smaller ground sets, um, we can do that thing. So how do we uh, do that? Well. If you have a family F, what is the natural way to partitioning it? A natural way to partition it is to partition it into those of sets containing the last element N 
or those that do not contain the last element n. Let me write it like this, fn bar. So those f containing n and those f not containing n. Okay, you can visualize this. How do you visualize this? This is one way. Um, let's draw a picture. Always good to draw some pictures to visualize it, to have better understanding. So let's suppose your family is uh, something like this. Okay, so if this is your family, then, um, and this direction is a direction N, the up direction is direction N, then um, this will be those not containing N, right? The, the things on the first floor. And then the things on the second floor will be those that contains n. Does it make sense, this picture? Another way to look at this is, this is just a way to split hypercube, where you can think of hypercube as binary strings. And those not containing n are binary strings where the last coordinate is zero. N's coordinate, right? So you look at F as a collection of binary strings, you pick out those, last coordinate is zero. That's the one not containing N. And these are the ones the last coordinates is one. So that's one natural way. Now I will leave it as exercise for you to prove using this way of splitting and induction, using partition in one and induction, prove that you, I want you to prove sour shallow, but in an even stronger way, what? Um, prove this theorem for any family, the number of shattered sets, the number of sets that are shattered by F in N is at least the number of sets in F, the cardinality of F. Why is this stronger? So this exercise, why is this stronger than sour shell Well, Let's see the remark. This theorem, which is by pa Pager, I mean, I think 1985, implies Sauer Um, because if your VC dimension of F is D, Okay, then any shattered set has size at most d, correct? If you have a set that's shattered, which has size d plus one, then your basic dimension will be d plus one. So that would imply, this would imply the number of shattered sets is at most the size of the first d plus one layers is at most m plus zero, m plus d, right? And um, the above theorem says f is less than that, which is the thing we want to prove. So this is a slightly stronger theorem, which can be proved using 
induction and this way of partitioning, I'll leave it as exercise. So let's move on to the second proof, also using induction and shifting we've seen. This looks closer to the proof we did for Kruska Katona. Let's do that. Second proof. So the first proof. Second proof. Um, what's the intuition? Again, we want to get rid of the um, last elements. So what would be a good way to partition the family to get rid of uh, the element M, say? Well, still want to get rid of element N and apply induction. So now another natural way to split this family is let's consider F1 obtained from F. This will be what's the very brutal way of getting rid of element N. You just look at the trace of F on the first N minus one elements. All right, so let me draw a picture. Okay, so this is our original family F. Yeah, um, if you want to more, be more concrete, this is a direction one, direction two, the top is direction three. So it includes in this family, the empty sets, this bottom left points. And what is this point? Well, it goes in direction one, but not in two and three, so it just a singleton set one. This is set two. This is set, uh, what is this? You only go in direction three, so this is singleton set three. This is one and three, right? And this one is everything, one, two, three. Good. Now, I look at the trace, and let's, this is an example, n equal to three. In this example, so now we restrict ourselves to the first two. So that means we look at this part. This is um, the trace of these. What would be a good way to say this? Um, okay. A good way to visualize this is we say um, we can visualize this as applying gravity on direction n. So that means we do free fall. Along direction n. Yeah. So what is direction n? It's direction three here. 
do free fall means the sets drop down, drop down. But if there's already something down there, good, we have this. We look at the trace, right? That means the intersection with this hyperplane. So drop down and drop down. So we have this one also as a trace. I should draw this. So this is one, two, which come from this one, two, three. Okay. One, two, three, the trace on the first two coordinate is one, two. So this is my um, F1, which is F restricted to the first M minus one coordinates. So the thing is, we are losing some sets. Um, this guy sort of get replaced by its trace, but these two are left untouched, right? These two didn't do anything. So we have to also take those two into account to maintain the cardinality. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna take their shadow down here. So that motivates the definition of F2. So F2 is all those sets F in F satisfying two things. It basically comes in pair along direction three. Okay. What we want to do is we want to partition F into F1 and F2, even though it's not a real partition, but we want the size of F1 plus the size of F2 equals to the size of the original family. So you pair up in direction three. Whenever there's a such pair, you take their shadow. In other words, you take F in F, where um, F, first of all, it lives on the bottom floor, meaning that N is not in F. Second of all, um, F union N, its pair is also in F. This these ones, right? So I draw a picture. This is my F2. So now we have two family, the red one and the green one, both living in M minus one now. Even though they are not the partition of F, but what we do know is the sum of their sizes is the original family. This is clear from the picture and the construction, but you can try to prove it rigorously yourself. So um, we have some basic observation, F1, F2, both live in M minus one. And what's important is, even though they are not a partition, but we have F equals to the sum of F1 and F2. Um, that's first observation. Claim. So try to prove it rigorously yourself. The second claim. Um, this is exercise. But it should be clear from the construction. Second claim is uh, the VC dimension. Of F2, the second family, the green family, is one less than the original family F. The original family has visit dimension at most D, then F2 has visit dimension at most D minus one. This basically proof idea, more like idea, try to make it rigorous, is that if A, a set, is shattered by F2, then what you need to do is to show A union, the last elements as a new sets is shattered by F. 
Um, try to prove it rigorously yourself, but let me prove it for you while pictures on the picture. So how do I prove it on the picture? Um, okay. On the picture, when do you have a set shutter? The set one, two is shattered, means you're gonna look at the hypercube corresponding to the first two coordinates, which is this bottom plane here. It's shattered means the traces on this, you project everything to this plane. The traces here occupy all points of this hypercube. In this case, there's only four points. So if all hypercube are occupied, this set is shattered, all right? So now, if, what's our claim? If A is shattered by F2, so if something is shattered by the green one, here, direction one is shattered, right? If some subcube is shattered, then remember the common pair. If you're adding element three, those are also there. So you have two hypercube all together, you get a hypercube of one dimension higher. So that means if you now project things to this plane, this hypercube, every all the traces are there. That's all right. That's the proof by picture. Any question? Mm -hmm. Just need to realize um, you just need to realize if a set is in F2, then this set union N is also in F2. Okay, now up to these two claims, which are easy to prove yourself. Uh, let's finish the conclusion of Sauerschella. Now, the size of F1, um, okay, let's do the formal proof. Sauerschella. What we're gonna do is induction, double induction, induction on dimension D, and then inner induction, we have induction on uh, the ground set N. So the in the outer loop, base case for D, the outer loop is easy. When D equal to one, you can just draw it by hands. I'll skip that. Let's look at the outer one, inductive step. Now we're gonna do an induction in N. In the induct outer inductive step of the outer one, we do induction on N. In here, the base case is what? N equal to D. The number of elements should be at least the largest size of a set that's shattered, right? And this is trivial because the sum of these binomial coefficients when n equals to d, it's just everything, two to be d. And the total number of subsets in n, which equals to d, is two to be d. So that's easy. This is trivial. Um, so let's do the inductive step. So, so far, this is inductive step for d, yeah? Now we have inductive step Um, for n. Um, so we have, let's look at, we do the partition F1, F2. So F1, the size is at most, 
remember f1 lives in f1 is a subfamily of 2 to the n minus 1. So we can use induction hypothesis for n, which tell us this is at most n minus 1 to 0. This is dimension just d, at most the original family, right? The trace of uh, a family, the basic dimension is no larger than the basic dimension of the original family. Good. Now let's look at F2. And for F2, by the claim, VC dimension of F2 is one smaller. So we can use the induction hypothesis of the outer loop, which is at most induction hypothesis on D. So you have N choose. The ground set is again N minus one. So actually, I will write it like this. It's at most m minus one. That's the ground set. Choose zero plus da da da. M minus one. Choose d minus one. Right. The VC dimension is d minus one. Now you just need to um, pair up this thing. This binomial coefficient thing, you get f equals to f1 plus f2, which is at most. The first thing is just 1. Let's change that 1 to n to 0. These two are the same. And the red one becomes what? n choose 1. Dot, dot, dot. The green one becomes n choose d as desired. Any question? Now let's do a third proof of sour shala. Shifting methods. Similar to the Cruz Cacatona. So well, how do we do shifting? We already got some idea. Let's look at the type example that already suggests what's the shifting here. This is the type example for sour shala. What's this thing? The union of the first d plus one layers. In particular, this is a downset. Remember downsets when we talk about Harris climate inequality? It just means downward close. If a set is if a set is in our family, all its subsets is in our family. It's in our family, all its subsets in our family. Yeah. Downward closed. I mentioned about. I defined it before. So that sort of means what? We want to do shifting, shifting towards to a downset. If we know in shower shala that our family is a family with VC dimension D and additionally it's a downset. This is trivial because in the downset, every set is shattered. All these subsets are there. So in a downset with VC dimension D, you cannot have a set of size D plus one. And naturally this is an upper bound. In other words, to prove sour shala using shifting, we just need to shift from F to another family F prime with the same VC dimension and same cardinality. That's enough. And the final one is a downsets, right? 
that will be our idea. So the idea is to shift F to a new family, to a family F prime that is a downset. Okay. And without changing the cardinality. Without changing cardinality and VC dimension. Okay. And without increasing VC dimension. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do. If we can do that, we are done. Right? Um, because then in a downset F prime, all sets are shattered. That means the size of sets is at most VC dimension, which is D, implied, which implied the desired bound. And we are happy. So what will be the shifting? It's very similar to what we've seen in Cruz Cacatona. And um, the intuition is, if this is not a down set, which when it's not a downset, you have a set F, you have a set F prime, which is a subset of F, such that this is in our family, but this is not. That's bad, right? It's not a downset. Some subset of our member is not the member. Then we're gonna shift F to F prime. We can replace F to F prime. You drop it down. Keep doing this, we'll get a downset. That's the idea. So the and this idea basically we apply remember this thinking of as applying uh gravity, you drop it down, apply gravity, but in all direction. In all direction you apply gravity. Whenever you have a set, its subset is not in our family, you drop it down to the subsets. And you do it in all direction. Okay. Now, if you look at this new family here, when you drop this guy down here, this new family now is, in this sense, compressed. It's a downset. Because in all direction, this direction or this direction, what, what are the other direction? And this direction. If you apply gravity, you get the same family. Nothing changed. So this is completely compressed. This is downsets, right? We apply gravity in all direction, basically. If you want to use an informal way to describe this. So let's define it formally. For every i in n, in every direction, we define this gra gravity fall. This, I will call it free fall in direction n, uh, in direction i. Before we did the direction n free fall, now we're going to do in all direction. We define shift of f or any f in our family. We define f to be f minus i. You do the free fall. If that position is not occupied already, what does it mean? 
if first of all i has to be ours in our set then you do the free fall means the position f minus i is not already in our family so you can free fall to that position otherwise you don't do anything so it's almost the same as Crookes Kakatona, except that in Crookes Kakatona, we need to make it up with the element of one. Good. And because of this operation, uh, let me also define SI of F, just the family of all SIF. You apply this with F in F. Okay. Now I will leave you as an exercise to show that. Um, for every family F, we can, it's a finite process, finite process to compress it, i.e. Um, to arrive, to obtain a prime such that um, S i f prime is the same as f prime for any i in n. So this is compressed in this definition. And um, for any f, it's a finite process to keep applying this shifting operation to change this to a compressed family. And um, another exercise to show such compressed family is a downset. This is almost trivial, right? If you have a, if it's not a downset, that means you have some F and some F prime, which is a proper subset of F, which is not in your family. So that means you go along this chain, f to f prime, you look at the first element, then you can, do sh you, you, you can delete the element. You can delete this element doing this shift, right? Some elements. That's another observation. So we do shift from one to another, uh, which is a downset. Now we need to, to make sure two things. Cardinality is not changing. This dimension is not increasing. Cardinality is not changing. It's easy also. Um, SIF has the same size as the original. Shifting does not change the cardinality. This is also almost trivial. Prove it. Uh, then we need to show that this dimension the last claim exercise is the shifted family um, So if this shatters a set A, then so does F. F also shatter. The shifted one shatters that, then the original one also. This is also trivial. Let's look at here, this picture. The shifted one, this is the shifted one, right? It shatters these. Then the original one, which is everything here, also shatter because the shadow, you just pull it down. This is almost also trivial from the picture. So try to prove it yourself. Um, actually, you can prove something slightly stronger. Remember in Cruz Cacatona, recall, in Cruz Cacatona, we have, if you apply this um, um, shadow 
and shifting. This is a subset of you apply shadow and then this shifting. You can swap these two operations. Same thing is true here, which it's a stronger proof of this exercise. Stronger holds. Conclusion. Holds. What? I do the shifting. Now my operation is, I don't care about shadow. I care about the trace. And I consider a trace on some sets. Uh, T, say. So T is a subset of the ground set. This is a subset of you first take the trace and then you do the shifting. Okay. This is stronger because that means if um, if the shifty family, the trace, if the shifty family shatters some set T, then already um, this has size also 2 to the T, right? If this is 2 to the T, this has size 2 to the T. But this, by the previous exercise, has the same size as what's inside. So that means what's inside is also 2 to the T, implying this exercise, right? Um, now we are done. Combining all these, we obtain from F, shift, keep shifting. It's a finite process, a downset F prime without changing the cardinality, without increasing the visit dimension. So the visit dimension of the new family, this downset is at most D. That means every set is shattered, must have size at most D. We get a desired bound. Any question? Okay. If there's no question, we will move down, move on to the next topic, which is about, um, a new method called dimension arguments. And families with restricted intersection. Okay. Um, we now consider now let's consider families with restricted intersection. This is not nothing new. We just talk about, talk about it more systematically here with this linear algebra technique. Why this is nothing new? If you recall, what is Erdős Corrado? That's uniform family such that the restricted intersection, the in requirement is Intersection cannot be zero. They need to be pairwise intersecting. If you consider, um, well, in some sense, you can also phrase what are the other things, Smyrner as restricted intersection. For every set A and B, their intersection must be the cardinality of the smaller one, sort of. 
So um, the main thing is we want to introduce this uh, linear algebraic technique, which is quite useful in proving some upper bounds for extremal problems where the extremal family is not unique. In two rounds theory, we see in graph theory, it has a unique extremal example. This kind of problem, um, we have some nice way of handling them, uh, but for problems with various different optimizer, extreme examples, they tend to be harder. Uh, in these cases, dimension argument becomes quite handy, oftentimes. So this dimension argument is often handy, often useful when the extremal problem has many distinct extremal structure. What's the idea? of the dimension argument. The idea is um, the objective, the goal is to prove an upper bound. We want the upper bound, this is our goal. How do we do it? We're gonna cleverly map the objects in F. The idea is to um, map objects in F injectively into, uh, say, a vector space. such that the images of these objects in our family are linearly independent. Why is that useful? Then that means because this is injective, so the size of F is the size of the image, which because it's linearly independent, so it's at most the dimension of the vector space B, right? And usually we map it to some vector space that we know how it looks like. So we can estimate its dimension. Let's see some example. Um, this is nothing new. We've seen in odd town, even town at the introduction of this course, these are dimension arguments. Basically, we associate these clubs in this town with restricted intersection, um, some autonomous basis in this vector space binary vector space F2 to the n. And they are um, linearly independent. So dimension in of F2 to the n is n, if you recall, uh, odd town, even town. So we've seen this. Already in odd town, even town problem. Okay, if this doesn't ring the bell, Go back and check lecture one or two, I don't quite remember. So let's see a more complicated, not, not more complicated, another very fundamental result in combinatorics, the incidence geometry um, using this dimension arguments. Another um, easy um, 
classic result. In incidence geometry. It has various different proofs, combinatorial proof. You can prove it geometrically. Uh, but let's see a linear algebraic proof using this dimension argument. This is um, a result about a projective plane. So let's quickly recall the definition of projective plane. There are many ways to define projective plane, equivalent ways, by quotient, by uh, introducing points at infinity and, and lines at infinity, and so on and so forth. Uh, but let's look at the axiomatic definition, which suffices for our purpose and is easy to see without much prerequisites. So a projective plane <clears throat> definition And here, let's all consider a finite projective plane. A projective plane um, consists of, let's try, consists of lines and points, a set of lines and a set of points. You have lines and points. Okay. Satisfying the following uh, and, and there is a relation between line and point, which we call incidence. So if a point is on the line, we say a point is incident with a line and vice versa, a line is incident with a point. So here is example incidence, PL. P is incident with L and vice versa. L is incident with P. So you see some symmetry here. I can swap the row of lines and points. And that's why we use incidence. We want we don't we don't want to see P lies on L. We actually you can have duality. You can swap the row. Everything still holds. But let's not worry about that. Um good. We have a set of points, a set of lines, and the relation so this is P is incident with L. If P is here, L is here, this is P prime. P prime is not incident with L prime, okay? Uh, what are the three axioms such that the first axiom is for any two points, there exists exactly one line. incident with both of them. Second one, swapping point and line, same still holds for any two lines. So for any two lines, there exists exactly one point incident with both of them. These are the two key ones. The third one, just to avoid degeneracy, the third one says roughly, there is this four points in general position, sort of. What does it mean in general position? That means, i.e., for any line in our sets, it's incident to is incident to at most two of these points. So what will be a bad case? Well, I don't want something, they all line on the line, right? Then you cannot find the four points where 
this is sort of degenerate. This is to avoid degeneracy. In other words, in projective plane, there's no notion of parallel lines. You can think it this way. Any two lines, they must have uh, intersection points. Here's an example, the finite one. The famous Fennel plan. It has seven points, seven lines. Every two points contains a line. Every, oh, sorry. <laughs> Between every two points, there's a line going through them. Every two line, they have exactly one common point. So it looks like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you have line one, line two, line three, line four, line five, line six, Okay, so in the middle, there's also a point, the seventh point. So now we have seven points and six lines so far. The seventh line looks a little bit strange, but let's look which two, our requirement is every two lies on the line. All the pair lies on the line now, except these two pair, there's no line containing them. These two pair, no line containing them. These two pair, no line containing them. So we're going to draw a line containing these three triple. Now every pair lies on the line. Even though this line looks like a circle, it's an abstract stru structure satisfying these axioms, right? So the last line, This is the last line. This is an example. Let me state the theorem, the De Bruyne Erdős theorem, and then we prove it next time. So the Brian Erdős theorem says, um, let P be a set of M points in a projective plane. They are not degenerate, not all on the line. You don't have everything on the line. You have endpoints, not collinear. Then, conclusion is the number of lines determined by P. What does it determine by P? Remember, between every two points in the projective plane, there's one line going through them. So you take the collection of all lines that are going through two points of P. This is, that means the lines determined by P. We have a lower bound on that. The number of lines determined by P is at least the number of points in P, which is N. Okay. This is what we will prove. In fact, something stronger is true. Um, we will only prove this part using linear algebraic uh, technique. Something stronger is that 
um, if equality holds, um, when, then, if equality holds, then either we know how it looks like, either P itself is a projective plane, smaller size, or everything is a projective plane, or P looks like this. You have M minus one point collinear point and one point outside. Then how many lines determined by this set of points? So this is my P, right? You have M point. The line determined by pairs on this collinear point is just a single line. And here you have M minus one lines that look like this. Together you have N lines. So there's only two scenarios where equality holds. Either yourself is a projective plane or it look like this. But I include this part, equality part, just for completeness of the statement. We will only prove these parts. That the for any set of points, let me repeat, for any set of endpoints in the projective plane, the number of lines determined by this set of points is at least the size of this set of points. Okay. Um, so we're going to continue on this Thursday. And also on Thursday, please remind me to give you some information about uh, the final exam, how we're going to take the final exam. Uh, Right. Okay. Thanks for listening.